كل هذا ونحن نريه الآيات كلما ذكر لنا حقيقة ذكر لنا الآيات وهو يوافق على ذلك ثم قلنا ها أنت ما رأيت بنفسك حقائق علم الفلك الحديث بعد أن استخدم الإنسان هذه الأجهزة والصواريخ وصف الفضاء واكتشف هذه المعلومة فأنت ذا قد رأيتها ثم رأيت كيف جاءت في هذه النصوص القرآنية قبل 1400 سنة فما رأيك في هذا؟ فأجاب I'm impressed at, at uh, how remarkably some of the uh, ancient writings uh, seem to correspond to uh, modern and, and recent astronomy. Uh, I'm not uh, a sufficient scholar of, uh, of human events and of, of human history uh, to uh, project myself completely and reliably in, into the uh, The circumstances that an ancient, uh, or that, that 1400 years ago uh, would have prevailed. But uh, uh, certainly, uh, I'd like to leave it that, that uh, what we have seen is, uh, is remarkable. Uh, it may or may not admit of, of uh, scientific explanation. There, there may uh, well be, have, well, have to be. Uh, Uh, something beyond uh, what we understand as ordinary human experience uh, to account for the writings that we've seen. But uh, it's not uh, my intention or my, my position at this point to provide uh, a, uh, an answer to that. I, I've said a lot of words without, uh, I think, expressing exactly what you want me to express, but... Uh, As it's my job as a scientist to remain uh, independent of, of certain questions, and I think that's one that I've just stopped just a little bit short of, of giving you the complete answer that, that you might desire. No. No. I'm wrong, sir. And you have to follow the method of the human that is not the same as the human being. قد جاء إلى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم من مصدر بشري لابد أن هناك مصدر وراء تفكير هؤلاء العلماء إنه إنه الذي يعلم السر في السماوات والأرض Okay firstly for the record could you please say what your name is My name is Thomas Armstrong. I uh, have been a professor of physics and astronomy for 35 years at the University of Kansas. Uh, I uh, retired from that uh, eight years ago and have been in the private sector in uh, a uh, technology business ever since. Right. Now, you, um, I think it was some point during the 1980s, I think, you were invited to, um, well, you ended up at an event where you were asked questions um, about verses in the Quran. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, what were the circumstances which led to you attending this event? Well, I was invited by some uh, students, international students at the University of Kansas, to uh, visit Jeddah and to uh, interview or be interviewed by uh, Sheikh Zendani. And since I was scheduled uh, to attend a meeting in Europe anyway, and my wife was going to join me with th for that, I s accepted uh, the uh, offer to uh, fly to Jeddah for a couple of days before I went back to the meetings I uh, had scheduled in France. So that uh, explains the fact that I was uh, in Jeddah along what, what with was the, uh, what, what Do you recall what they said was the purpose of this uh, event? The proclaimed purpose was to uh, discuss um, uh, 
matters in astronomy and the origin of the solar system, the cosmogony of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And was there uh, any mention of religion before you agreed to attend? Uh, not really, but I did understand that uh, Sheikh Zendani was a, uh, a religious man, a religious person. Yeah. And uh, that's about the extent of it. Right. Okay. Um, so while you were at this event, can you explain what the circumstances were which led to you being presented with verses from the Quran and being asked to comment on them? Sure. Um, I understood that I was to uh, be interviewed and to uh, uh, respond to questions. And so, in fact, I was... Uh, uh, taken from the hotel to uh, the uh, the site of the interview, which was set up with uh, recording equipment and uh, a translator. I do not know Arabic. I don't know the first part of it. And uh, so the uh, interaction was completely uh, via a, a translator uh, who translated from English to Arabic and Arabic to English uh, for the question and answer uh, part of the interview. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the circumstances. Um, would, now, I sent you um, a script. It was a small extract from the, uh, the official book that went with the video that was produced from your interview. Um, which was called This is the Truth. Um, there's a small uh, extract in that which I've sent through to you that you've had a look at. Um, if you've got enough time and you're willing, would it be okay for us to quickly go through that? Would oh, that sure. Okay? Not a problem. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, it starts by introducing you, um, saying that you work at NASA. Um, and it says, we asked him about iron and how it was formed. He explained how all the elements in the earth were formed. He stated that scientists have come only recently to discover the relevant facts about the formation process. He said that the energy of the early solar system was not sufficient enough to produce elemental iron. Um, in calculating the energy required to form one atom of iron, it was found to be about four times as much as the energy of the entire solar system. In other words, the entire energy of the Earth or the Moon or the planet Mars or any other planet is not sufficient to form one new atom of iron. Even the energy of the entire, even the energy of the entire solar system is not sufficient for that. That is why Professor Armstrong said that the scientists believe that iron is an extraterrestrial that was sent to Earth and not formed therein. Okay, I think I'll stop at that point. How does that sound so far? That is hopelessly confused. <laughs> and yeah. um, as I reflect on how that might have been, uh, what might have been lost in translation. Can I just, uh, sorry, can I just end this call and restart because my video view is frozen. I'll, I'll just, I'll call you directly back. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're moving again now. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the, uh, what was probably lost in translation was uh, a lot. Uh, yes, iron is an element that is not formed in stars as small as the sun. Uh, it takes much more energy, much more uh, gravitational uh, energy from larger stars to make iron, and um, that is the reason why astronomers then and now understand that the solar system was formed out of the debris from earlier stellar explosions, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the fact that the Earth and other objects in the solar system have iron really means that the solar system was formed out of uh, this material that was present in the galaxy from earlier 
uh, stellar explosions, supernova explosions, and other uh, generations of stars that were uh, born and and uh, destroyed before the Earth, before the solar system was even formed. Um, when he when he was citing this, um, when he was discussing this, what he cited to you um, was a verse in the Quran, chapter fifty-seven, verse twenty-five, which says, "And we sent down iron." which is great might and has many benefits for mankind. Um, do you think that it's an accurate description to say that iron was sent down to Earth? Not, not really, no. No, it's, it was an entirely natural process. It's understood to be a, uh, uh, you know, iron along with, all the, with lots and lots of other chemical elements uh, yeah. were present at the time of this, the... Uh, uh, natural processes that formed the solar system. No magic, nothing supernatural, nothing div divine is required to explain it. Okay. Um, he goes on to say, then we asked him about the sky and whether it had any gaps or rifts in it. He disproved this and replied that we are talking. what we're talking about is a branch of astronomy called integrated cosmos, which we scientists have only come to know recently. For example, if you have a body in outer space which travels a certain distance in any direction and then travels the same distance in a different direction, you will find that the mass weight is the same in all directions because this body has its own equilibrium, the pressures from all directions are the same. Without this equilibrium, the whole universe would collapse. I'm not really <clears throat> sure what he's talking about. Yeah, yet, that, that, ha that has very little to do with what... Uh... I would have said in, in that time, uh, they are probably referring to cosmology, which was a well-established uh, area of uh, astronomical research uh, at that time. And cosmologists were working out how uh, to explain the expansion of the universe and uh, the various uh, observed attributes of the universe and uh, the you know it's it's very likely that the translation was inaccurate I can't you know there there's nothing I would have said could have said that would have been made any sense at all that resembles the the quotation there okay um so the verse that he was referring to, Quran 50 colon 6, do they not look at the sky above them, how we have made it and adorned it, and there are no flaws in it? Did that strike you particularly as revelational? No, no, that, that's, uh, and there's, there's nothing new or original or, or even uh, accurate about that. The, the cosmos is a very, uh, active place. It's evolving. It's changing. It's been this, uh, you know, stars are born, stars die. Uh, there are all sorts of exotic objects in it. And uh, no, no, it, uh, the cosmos is what it is for natural reasons, not for divine reasons. Then we talked to Professor Armstrong about the attempts of scientists to reach the edge of the universe, and we asked him whether they were successful in this. He replied that they are fighting an uphill battle to the edge of the universe. We construct more powerful equipment to observe the universe, only to discover that the new stars we see are still within our galaxy, and that we have not yet reached the edge of the universe. That, that can't, that's not accurate. Uh, yes. The, the entire history of cosmology has been the attempt to extend the observations to greater and greater distances, to greater and greater uh, uh, what's called redshifts, the cosmological expansion that's been known since the 1930s uh, due to Hubble and, and others uh, uh, provide the, the means to uh, uh, infer the distance of, of uh, distant galaxies from their, the amount of their redshift. And 
the notion that o- that stars are, are only being born in our own galaxy is is not correct. Uh, there's uh, stellar uh, processes, stellar evolution going on throughout uh, the cluster of galaxies and throughout the universe, for sure. Um, with this uh, piece of text, he was referring to um, 67 colon 5, which is, and we adorned the lowest heaven with lamps, and we made such lamps missiles to drive away Satan's. Um, indeed, all these stars are adornments for the lowest heaven. And he says that scientists have not reached the end of the universe. Um, and because of this, you, scientists are thinking about putting telescopes in space. I didn't. I didn't realise that. I, I, I'm not really uh, not really been following astronomy all my life, but I'm quite surprised that we wouldn't have had telescopes in space in the 1980s. Did we have telescopes in space in the 80s? Oh yeah, there there. Yeah, there were there were small telescopes in space, and this was well before the Hubble telescope. It was uh, uh, in development in in those times, but there were several other uh, smaller uh, optical and and other uh, sensors uh, doing that kind of work from orbit in those days in eighty three, eighty four. Uh, that's fine. Uh, um, yeah, so the, so yeah. the verse about um, uh, adorning the lowest... It's not really relevant. Sorry, uh, the verse about adorning the lowest heaven with lamps, which are missiles to shoot down Satan's, uh, do, is that particular... Was that, were you particularly impressed by uh, Zindani revealing this text? No, no. no. Uh, that, that is... Uh, that has no uh, basis in astronomy or observation or theory or anything scientific that that may be an, a religious opinion and uh, as such uh, not something that that I can validate or or uh, otherwise comment on out, out of curiosity if the nearest star to our solar system were to launch a missile at something on her on earth how long would that take to reach us um the if it, Assuming it could travel at the speed of light, say, just yeah. to make it easy. Yeah, the nearest star is about four light years away. So it would okay, take so about four years. Now, the next part of this transcript says, Each time Professor Armstrong told us some scientific fact, we mentioned to him the relevant verse with which he agreed. Then we said to him, You have seen and discovered for yourself the true nature of modern astronomy by means of modern equipment rockets and spaceships developed by man. You have also seen how the same facts were mentioned by the Quran 14 centuries ago. So what is your opinion about these? Well, he, 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 it seems here he's giving the impression that you talk about something and every time he said something, go, hang on a minute, I already know because it's in the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was a rhetorical question. You can't tell me anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if one is not constrained to uh, impute meaning to words before the uh, the statement is made, one can always reinterpret uh, generalities to be uh, in agreement with specifics. Unfortunately, science doesn't proceed that way. Religion may proceed that way, but science does not. Uh, when astronomers make observation, they get numbers, they get facts, they get relationships that are uh, clear and concise. That's the goal, at least. And and their, their job is not finished until they have the... Uh, the phenomena measured, observed, interpreted, and placed in a uh, an appropriate relationship with other observed phenomena. And uh, the generalities, the ambiguities, the the other uh, uh, claims that that uh, are made with religious uh, implication are just are just that. They're they're only claims and. Uh, 
what what the whole exercise uh, uh, appears to have been uh, in, intended to accomplish was to uh, develop what we would call ad hoc explanations, not not other, anything other than than uh, listening to to uh, a, a recent discovery and and then. Uh, reinterpreting a uh, some sort of ancient claim to to be consistent with it, and that uh, that's not science. That's not even really very good anything else. But that's a separate question. Um, at this point, um, he claims that once he'd asked you how you, what your opinion is about these facts being mentioned, this is where they cut to a video clip of you talking. Um, and it's it's a pretty much unedited clip of you, yeah. of you talking, so they haven't snipped bits of sentences out, but it does look suspiciously like there's a little bit of context missing. Um, he asks you this question, and you say, that is a difficult question which I've been thinking about since our discussions here. I am impressed at how remarkably some of the ancient writings seem to correspond to modern and recent astronomy. So that first part, were you, were you genuinely impressed about not, how remarkably the writings matched? Not, not really, not really, no. That, that's a, uh, a misapprehension of, of uh, what the circumstances were. Right. It's not right. Um, so when you were saying that um, you were impressed uh, um, by, um, sorry, I've just lost my place in the script. Uh, you were, you were impressed by how remarkably some of the ancient writings seem to correspond to modern and recent astronomy. Um, can you recall what what you were probably what point you were trying to make there? Um, no, I'm not at all sure uh, that I I recall uh, what I would have been. Uh, uh, referring to with that statement, the uh, the 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 problem is that that the the religious claims, the ancient uh, Quranic writings and so forth, are are just uh, they can be interpreted in any way that is seen as convenient and expedient uh, in the present time. And uh, for, for whatever reason, that that's uh, um, that's not science. It's yeah. it's it's uh, not even really very uh, very good philosophy in 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 my regard. Okay, your statement goes on to say, certainly I would like to leave it at that. That what we have seen is remarkable it may or may not admit of scientific explanation. There might have been something beyond what we understand as ordinary human experience to account for the writings that we have seen. No, no. And, and the idea that, that one uh, has to uh, uh, abandon attempts to understand uh, and say, oh, well, we don't understand it, therefore God did it. Yeah. That that that's not right. That that's a uh, that's a cop out, and uh, it it, it uh, serves no useful purpose, um, and it's wrong. You finish by saying uh, in the video footage of you, I have said a lot of words without, I think, expressing exactly what you want me to express. But it's my job as a scientist to remain independent of certain questions. And I think that, and I think that is one of the reasons that I'd better stop just a little bit short of giving you the complete answer that you might desire. Yeah. Could, could you is could, could you um, perhaps reword that in a less polite way? Um, um, extrapolate on it, perhaps. Well, I. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean please. Could you be rude? I'm, I just mean. Yeah. In, in, in in these times, uh, 
Um, yes, I, I was being charitable and polite at that time. Really, the notion of using uh, science to try to justify religious beliefs and behaviors is uh, a misuse of science. And it's a, a poor service, for that matter, in my view, of uh, religious issues to, to try to, uh, to frame it that way. Uh, there, the, the attempt to validate and, and justify religious beliefs in scientific terms is doomed to failure. It just will not work, has not worked, and uh, over, over time, I have uh, come to uh, uh, realize that more and more every day. Uh, you just have to go where honest observation of reality and experimentation leads. And the answer is, the answer that God did it is never adequate. Okay. Um, so that I think will uh, we'll cut short that. Well, we'll finish on the transcript there. So that's just about where the transcript finishes, except for Zindani goes on to say, indeed, it is you know, hard to explain how this stuff can be in there. But um, from the discussion we've just had, um, it seems that Zindani's impression of what you were saying is slightly different to the impression that you wish to give him. Well, that's, that returns to the question of translation and whether the, uh, the translations of the questions and the answers were, uh, were faithful and accurate and, and complete is not something that I, I'm in a position to, uh, yeah, that's uh, to comment on. So um, what do you think then on a scale of, say, zero to 100, how convinced do you think you were by Zindani's arguments that the Quran had a clearly supernatural origin? Zero. I suspected you'd say that. That's why. That's why I sprung it on you without, <laughs> without asking in advance if it was okay. <laughs> no, no. The, you know, it was it was an obvious uh, uh, exercise in in their attempt to uh, to develop uh, uh, a case uh, for uh, re uh, establishing uh, a religious. Uh, interpretation of, of nature that, that simply uh, isn't justified, okay. never has been, and probably never will be. So um, if it's okay now, just the, uh, the ending of the interview, which um, might seem slightly absurd, but there's a few things that I need to cover, which uh, often look a little bit silly. The first one is, um, I've, you're aware that I'm recording this call, and I'd just like to ask your permission if I may make it public. Oh, sure. Not a problem. Um, another question is, have I or anyone else offered to pay you for the interview that we're doing now? No. Um, are the opinions that you've expressed during this interview all your own? Yes. Um, uh, let me say, have you been threatened or intimidated to change your initial statements? And not at all. And finally, did you become a Muslim as a result of this event? No. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much, Tom Armstrong. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, good luck with your work. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. <laughs>